We're back. Welcome. Welcome to the Unriveted Podcast, where we dial in on technology, intersections of digital transformation, artificial intelligence, and people. In this podcast, we're going to talk about topics from the past, the present, and the future as they apply to AI, ML, and the modernization of process automation. This episode is brought to you by Wingnut Investments, where tightening is just a thumbscrew away. Hey, John, (laughs) what are we going to talk about today? All right. Hey, Martin, good to hear from you again. Today, we are going to continue our conversation with ChatGPT and see if we can uh, take a deeper dive into some of its abilities to generate code. Woohoo! John, oh my God, that's nice. I have so many things I want to do with (laughs) ChatGPT and coding. Can I go first? I'll do a couple. Yeah, yeah, of course. Absolutely. What do you got? All right, John. You know, because I'm just the hack I am, um, <laughs> I've, I've already thought this one out a little bit. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go off on the old console here, and I'm going to ask ChatGPT to write some Python code to connect to a Microsoft SQL Server for me. Now, I, I generally know what I need to do to do this, um, but let's say I'm just not comfortable with the nuances about Microsoft SQL Server, so I'm, I'm going to let it rip. And it's churning away. And sure as can be, it comes back and it says, sure, to connect to Microsoft SQL Server database using Python, you can use the Pi ODBC driver module, actually, um, which interfaces with ODBC. That makes sense. And nice, it, it starts nice. off. And here it's, you, it starts off with a nice import, um, all the parameters. This is beautiful, John. And uh, I'm, I'm happily impressed. You know what, John? I've got one more example. It's the same, just we're going to take it in a different direction. Let me cut and paste the text a little bit differently. And I'm going to do it for C++ because, you know, Ooh. I come from that world. I, I know it's, it's, it's difficult to believe. In the, in the beginning, before there was <laughs> Python working for you, what, although Python's been around, I was doing C++. It's been around for a while. Yeah, Python's uh, a lot older than people think it is, I think. I, I, I remember, so I won't say my first year of touching Python. Okay, I will. It's, I think, 1997. <laughs> there you go. I put it out there. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Okay, so this is doing pretty good. Um, it's got the requisite include files popping in, and uh, it enters, you know, it's uh, a little bit interesting. They have an air handler coming up right away. Love it. This is more my style of coding anyway. Still generating, still generating. I wonder how this will come on the video, but well, when I when I put it out there, it'll be interesting to see. Got a main. I didn't ask it to do a command line. It's just writing code for me. So it looks like I'm going to hard code some parameters, much like the Python. There's more lines involved here because there's um, yeah, just more to do in C++ uh, to make this happen. And what are your thoughts? Generally generally, what do you think about the code that's generated? Do you think it did well, a good job just from first glance? <laughs> yeah, you know what's what's important is um, so I'm I come from the world of code complete, and you do error handling. You check your return values of everything. You don't ignore it. You check for success. You move forward. It, it is absolutely doing all the things that I call minimal requirements for code complete, and. It's still generating more. I'm surprised how much it's generating compared to the Python. I think Python hides so much from you and, and makes it simple. Mm-hmm. And there it is. Agreed. Now I got my connect. I can see it popping up. And it's, you know, because C++ has exception handling built in. Um, it's got lots of fun stuff. It's printing out to standard out. And uh, it's giving me a handle. And at the end, it looks like it's going to close off the database, which is good. That's that's housekeeping. So for that, good. I give it kudos. Um, this wasn't rocket science, but when you write your API and you're going, you know, line by line and doing every command line parameter mm-hmm. and every option, this is a nice way to do it. I, I appreciate that. John, good, I think good. you get to take some shots at this one. <laughs> 
All right. Well, I, I appreciate it, Martin. I, you know, your background is, is a little bit different than mine. Mine's almost been exclusively focused on machine learning. So a lot of my programming applications that I've delved into in the past and the present uh, have to deal with ML. Um, so, and Python, obviously Python, which has kind of become the de facto standard uh, programming language for data science and ML engineering for uh, probably the reasons that you just described there. It's relatively easy to uh, use, I guess, compared to C++ and it's, you know, dynamic. So, you know, no need for like compiling it and it's um, executed there at runtime. So that aside, um, let's see what ChatGPT can do uh, for from the perspective of a, a machine learning pipeline. So. The first question I pose uh, to ChatGPT is write a Python function for data preparation in a machine learning pipeline. So it's, it's uh, you know, it's, a, it's not uh, very specific. You know, it's talking about a very particular part of the ML pipeline development process, data preparation. So I am kind of narrowing it down for ChatGPT. And ChatGPT, um, let's see what it comes back with. So sure, here's an example function of data preparation in a machine learning pipeline. And uh, ChatGPT has decided to use uh, the pandas library um, as Gotta an import. Gotta love pandas. Gotta love the pandas. Yeah, everyone's using, everyone's using pandas. Um, and scikit-learn. So scikit-learn, which is also kind of one of the standard libraries that we use for uh, developing data science models or ML pipelines. Um, so looking at the function, it's created a function simply called prepare data. Um, you know, again, taking aside what version of Python it's using, I've noticed that some of the arguments don't contain type hints, uh, which have become kind of a standard practice in Python 3.7, I wanna say, and newer. Uh, but that point aside, just looking generally at the function, it's created a function that has uh, included a um, a doc string, which is best practice. Uh, you know, what does this function do? What are the inputs? What are the outputs? What do I expect it to generate? Um, those two uh, or the three imports uh, are used obviously here. So the standard scaler uh, for scaling our variables or our uh, input features um, across the board prior to actually training the model. So that's a logical step. Um, nothing in terms of like dimensionality reduction, which also might be considered a data preparation stage, uh, like using PCA or something like that. Um, that's fine. You know, you don't want your functions to be overly bloated with uh, too many things, right? They're supposed to serve a single purpose uh, as in the solid uh, framework. Uh, but looking at this function generally, I know we're, you know, uh, kind of showing it on the screen. I got to say that it looks very familiar to me. Like it looks like a function that, you know, I would have seen on like a website or like a stack overflow, some kind of boilerplate function that I'm not sure if chat GPT is actually generating it or if it just understands the question and knows how to pull you know, that function into ChatGPT and give it as a response. Either way, um, I'd say it does serve the purpose. It didn't misunderstand the uh, question that I posed to it. And it even comes back with a little uh, follow-up blurb that says this function takes a pandas data frame uh, with feature and target columns and goes on and basically just kind of gives a uh, um, paragraph describing uh, exactly what's going on step by step. So um, again, you know, I'm not trying to say that ChatGPT didn't write this from scratch. I'm guessing it didn't, but you know, there's something to be said for utilizing standard best practices uh, and not trying to reinvent the wheel every time you wanna create a data preparation function. Um, so I think I'm satisfied with, with this, uh, and I, you can obviously build on it for your own purposes. If you were to use this, um, you know, for your own, uh, ML design project. So I'd say ChatGPT gets a star, a gold star for the, the first question, Martin. Interesting. You, you, um, brought up some comments here that make me think about 
are we on the edge of doing something unethical? But maybe that's a, a topic we can get into uh, another time. Um, but as a as a notion of the pair programmer, the co-pilot, no hints given away for the future here, but uh, <laughs> there may be some things to talk about. Uh, keep going, John. I agree. I agree. We, uh, I think that's definitely a topic worth talking about um, and relevant to today. So, all right. Let's see. Let's see if we can, uh, you know, take this further. Um, so next question to ChatGPT is, ChatGPT, write a unit test in Python for checking data quality in a data engineering pipeline. So this, you know, isn't necessarily focused on machine learning. Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh. Wait, 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 put the brakes on. Define data quality. Oh, wow. Data quality, Martin. Well, I think you might be referencing my favorite acronym about data quality, which is act ugly, ugly with oh, an I. And again, uh, I think you're getting into another, you're getting ahead of ourselves. We have, we have so uh, much time to talk about, <laughs> about how to act ugly for data quality. Let, we'll push that to another day, John. All right. Well, thanks for bringing it up, though, because uh, I might have forgotten about it. But uh, very good topic. We will cover how to act ugly in data quality management. So for now, let's look at the function what GPT, chat GPT gave back to us. So again, um, you know, uh, I asked, I didn't ask for a function this time. So uh, it looks like what chat GPT brought back was first it's using the unit test um built-in uh, Python library, um, as well as pandas again. So we're manipulating structured, you know, tabular data. Again, this probably wouldn't work if we're dealing with trying to build a uh, unit test for unstructured data like text or video or images, you know, for like a um, computer vision application. But nevertheless, I didn't give it a lot of information, right? I just said, write a unit test for data quality and data engineering. Um, so having used the unit test package before in Python, uh, you know, the standard is to create a class that inherits the, uh, unit test test case base class. Um, and it did create a couple of, uh, methods within that class. So test null values. So it's, you know, checking to make sure that our data, uh, you know, has, uh, or doesn't have, um, null values. And it looks like what we have on there is pretty standard. A question that I would have, though, um, is that packet, you know, Python libraries like pandas, because they're open source and updated all the time, they do tend to change, you know, the methods that you can use within there. So I wonder if this is based off a particular version of pandas and if that version changes or they deprecate some feature if chat GPT would, you know, change what it's showing me. I didn't say, I didn't specify a specific version of Python for it to use. Well, that's um, a good point, so, John. John, that point, you, you actually opened point. up another another window to the future. <laughs> it is it is a good point for checking out um, the uh, version control. You know, not only for our Python uh, uh, Python language, but also for all the packages that it's downloading as well, and best practices for that. That may also be another episode, Martin. I don't know. How, how much time do you have to talk with me? <laughs> it's uh, it's infinite, John. <laughs> or infinitesimal. So the, yeah, I like, I like that one better. Um, so back into our, our unit test. So test null values. So it's using the correct um, naming structure by using test underscore as a prefix to whatever it's testing. So if we were to run these in Python, it should automatically pick up those functions because they begin with test and use them for unit testing. And then it's also testing duplicate values. So we have null values and we have duplicate values, which are two very standard, you know, best practices for data quality. Again, there's things that we might not have in here for data quality, like the distribution of a, you know, a numerical feature, uh, which does become uh, very important when talking about things like data drift in our ML models uh, and how that can impact, 
their efficacy over time. So, but it is a class, so we could te technically extend this and use this as our beginning uh, for, you know, writing our code for whatever our application is. So again, long story short, I would say ChatGPT has gotten uh, a good start. I wouldn't say that I would just copy and paste this and drop it into my, you know, production code base, but it's a start just like the last one. Okay. I, I, I'm, I'm still impressed. Uh, you know, there, you know, let's, you know, let's keep this party going, John. All right. Well, I got, uh, I got a last one here, Martin. And this one, this one has special significance to me because I've used this example before um, when uh, training or, or talking to people about the limitations of machine learning, in this case, specifically deep learning and a specific application of deep learning, computer vision. So oh, no. trying to, oh, no. oh yeah. Oh no. <laughs> I, I think I can only imagine. Oh, this is a good one. This is a good one. This is a funny one, but nevertheless, uh, very relevant. So, um, you know, computer vision tasks are designed to basically build a machine learning model that can, you know, use images as a source of data with some sort of output that is related to images, you know, image segmentation, finding things in images. You know, you go on those websites and it's like, are you a robot? And it's like, find all the images in here of a, you know, a, a semi truck or something, <laughs> something like that. And I guess they don't think a computer can tell the difference between those, but I pose you this example, Martin, and this one is going to be very hard for our uh, audio only audience to appreciate, but for our video audience, the question I pose to ChatGPT is ChatGPT, write a function in Python for evaluating the output of a TensorFlow convolutional neural network used to classify images as either an image of a chihuahua the dog, or an image of a blueberry muffin. Now, you might be asking yourself, well, those don't seem like very similar things, but a, as you can a, see. Oh my, John, <laughs> I've never seen a, a wrapper on a, on, a, on a chihuahua, so how are we going to do this? Well, have you ever seen a sick chihuahua that just came back from the vet and they put one of those lampshades around its neck? Oh, there you, you go, me, man. <laughs> oh, yeah. I just thought of that off the top of my head, but that seems like that might actually, maybe that could fool, um, maybe that could fool a uh, computer vision uh, <laughs> system designed to differentiate these two. But anyways, I have an image that we can share here. And I think um, our viewers would agree that the difference between a Chihuahua's face and a blueberry muffin is actually kind of hard to tell, even for even even for people. Um, so, how would a computer go about doing this? Now, again, we have a function. I, <laughs> I might fail. <laughs> That's a, I mean, the one with the puppies, where it's a, a, a like a basket of of Chihuahua puppies next to a <laughs> a plate <laughs> a plate of uh, blueberry muffins. That is a little that is a little hard to tell <laughs> from far away. <laughs> But um, so this question, I did get a little more specific. So I said a function, first of all. Second of all, I specified TensorFlow, uh, you know, which is a uh, um, Python library for designing artificial neural networks and deploying them in production, uh, you know, similar to PyTorch. Um, and I, did, I specifically asked for a convolutional neural network, which is a type of neural network for images, classifying images. So now we have what we're trying to do with the image and what the images are. So there's a lot, what do we have there? We have uh, function, TensorFlow, convolutional neural network, classification problem, and the classes themselves. So I basically, in one convoluted sentence, <laughs> pun intended there, asked for five different things from uh, ChatGPT. And the function it provides is, well, what we see here uh, for our viewers, that is. Uh, first, it imports TensorFlow as the very first Python import. So it's got that down. Uh, NumPy, which is, you know, pretty much the uh, 
uh, de facto standard for uh, matrix multiplication used across pretty much every single machine learning algorithm that I've ever used. And then we have our function there called evaluate image, and it's provided with two different uh, arguments, image path and model path. We have our doc string again. And again, looking at this function, um, it still looks like maybe like a cookie cutter function that it, it pulled from somewhere off the internet. Um, I'm not saying it's doing what it's supposed to do incorrectly, but I think the real gold here, Martin, is at the very bottom of the function where we have our if else statement. And you can see that it's created two prediction variables, one in the if statement and one in the else statement. And it's actually dropped in there the names of our two classes, Chihuahua and Blueberry Muffin. And then the, awesome. uh, yeah, and it returns the, um, and, and then it returns the prediction, which is essentially the name that if we were to build this model, you know, is this an image of a Chihuahua or a Blueberry Muffin? So it returns one of those. And then a confidence score, which is essentially like a, a probability of how confident our model is that the image it's looking at is a Chihuahua or a Blueberry Muffin. So I think it got all five of those down. Again, it's thinking about, you know, ChatGPT is looking at it in a in a vacuum, right? We don't have all the other pre-processing and post-processing steps in here. But I got to say, I think ChatGPT today is three for three from my perspective, Martin. What are you, uh, what are your thoughts? So I think for my initial thoughts are for the people that understand what they're going after, and it's just not in the tip of their thought process, and they're looking for a template or a scaffold scaffolding to mm -hmm. start with i yep. think it works great i i do bring up that question i brought up earlier which i think we'll hit another another time and that's talking about sources of where maybe some of the design patterns may come from for implementation the actual code snippets um mm -hmm. but there be i mean the apis uh, apis are typically published so that's not a big deal but we start seeing some potential do I use the P word here? I'll, I'll use this plagiarism uh, examples, uh, question of intellectual property ownership. I, the, nothing we've done necessarily gets there, but mm -hmm. I think that will be something we should go down that path in the, in the future and, and maybe bring that up. That might be worthy. Um, but as a an assistant or assistant pair programmer working with me, oh my goodness, I could I could speed along my work. I could take something on, I could run a scaffolding and then I could I could beat it up until I, I need to beat it up and mold it to the shape I need it to be. It's just a mm -hmm. great helper to get me going. Right, right, right. And that's, you know, that I agree with you 100% on that. Um, and I'm looking forward to exploring the ethical uh, implications of chat GPT or any of the other uh, pair AI generating pair programming tools that have come around. Um, but I think you're right, you know, like this definitely, if it's on the, you know, the tip of your brain and you just don't know how to get started, I think that the examples that uh, ChatGPT has given us uh, are definitely good starting points. I think um, being, you know, one of the things that I was worried about when I did this was how specific can I get before ChatGPT breaks? And the last question here where I asked for five different things um was pretty specific and it looks like it um you know it, it came back with something that could definitely be usable so i would say if you know what you're asking for and you know what you need uh you know what you need and you can you know elucidate that and put it into words chat gpt at least um i don't think it's going to let you down so uh i i think uh, it's definitely part of the future like it or not what are we going to do martin are we going to are we going to lose our jobs <laughs> So, so I, I don't, I don't see it as losing my job. I see it as adjusting how I could be more optimal in my work or potentially I could be reducing the people count to doing certain types of work, but I may be mm -hmm. shifting more intelligence in higher level roles. So it's sort of like, you know, it's that whole industrial revolution 
uh, you know, higher lifting it up, lifting it up, lifting it up. So I think we could keep going on that journey, John. And um, I'm excited for this. I think there's other applications of generative uh, solutions in general, but mm -hmm. you know, the buzz is on here for ChatGPT. I, I think in our next episode, we should see. Um, I think we should do it. Sounds like a great idea. We haven't had our uh, we haven't had our fill of ChatGPT yet. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. And, 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 and with that, I think I call this episode a wrap. Thank you for joining us. And if you like us, put the old like button on. Thank you. <laughs>